Ok. So, welcome everybody. Uh, so today is probably the last topic about uh, this course, about the strategies for digital well-being. Um, then I will also introduce you to probably next in the next lecture to, sa to a specific evaluation technique in XCI that is heuristic evaluation that you will uh, adopt in the last assignment that will be next uh, Thursday. Um, the you will be asked to complete the last assignment uh, here in class. Uh, so try to be present here next Thursday and uh, also tell this information to your colleague that are not here today. Um, but again, today uh, I will try to show you how the community is, is moving uh, towards a new direction to try to overcome uh, the limits of the contemporary strategies for digital well-being that are basically digital self-control tools. Uh, and then you will have some time to finalize your uh, prototype and your very brief presentation. Okay, this is the outline for today. Uh, we'll analyze uh, a particular framework, the leverage points framework proposed by the, cen the Center from, for Humane Technology. And then we will analyze a set of, they are not guidelines, are heuristics. There is a mistake here for digital well-being. And we'll learn together uh, what is an heuristic. Um, so again, in the first part of this course, we have seen that the traditional approach to support people's digital well-being is uh, by means of digital self-control tools. And we also analyzed some of the main characteristics, main feature of these tools. But we also uh, understood that there are a list of gaps, a list of uh, limits of this strategy. Um, the first main limit is the self-monitoring nature. So uh, people need to figure out for themselves uh, both the causes of their problems and also possible solutions. Like for example, by uh, autonomously deciding which is uh, a correct threshold for a usage timer, for example. So the result is that these tools have a short-term effectiveness. Um, and they are not effective in the long term because they don't promote the formation of new habits. Um, another gap is this focus on single devices. So these tools work on uh, mobile apps only or browsers only, and they don't consider uh, complex uh, digital habits. Uh, and then we have also uh, analyzed this theoretical gap, right? So. Uh, contemporary tools are not particularly based on any, uh, any behavioral theories, and this is another reason for the short-term effectiveness of, of these tools. We have also seen that there are some attempts in developing and testing smarter and more proactive digital self-control tools, but again, having smarter digital self-control tools, at the end, doesn't solve the un this underlying contradiction of having technology to stop using other technology. So it's a contradiction that cannot be solved uh, via this, these tools. So the idea here uh, is to try to move beyond digital self-control tools. So this is the main idea of our research group, but also of our researchers in the XCI and digital well-being uh, domain um, because basically uh, the idea is that a more radical change, a change that involves uh, business model, regulations, policies, uh, uh, guidelines for designers would surely offer benefits to user and would be more effective than having uh, digital self-control tools with all the gaps that we have, we have seen. Um, and this should be also a responsibility of tech companies, right? Because right now, uh, promoting digital well-being has been seen as a responsibility of the user only. Uh, but here, the idea is that this is a responsibility of also of the tech companies, right? Uh, so as this happened for other topics like 
violence and radicalization on social networks, uh, we are pushing uh, this concept of um, responsibility also for the digital well-being uh, topic. Uh, for example, uh, a business model that focuses on uh, digital well-being rather than on capturing user attention, of course, may initially result in lower user engagement and also um, as a result in, in a lower profitability in the short term, but uh, it could also increase user loyalty in the long term. So there is this kind of trade-off uh, that should be analyzed and that could be also useful to be analyzed from the tech company side. And so uh, how can we uh, move towards this um, idea of overcoming digital self-control tools, moving beyond this kind of solutions? Um, we will see some, some opportunities here. And this is a framework extracted from, again, the website, the Center for Humane Technology. They propose this framework um, that describes how we can intervene in the tech uh, ecosystem uh, to promote more radical changes in, in this complex tech ecosystem. Um, so the framework is a model for intervening in the ecosystem at different levels. Um, obviously changes may happen uh, at multiple levels with different degrees of impact. Okay? So um, here in the figure, changes on the left are easy changes, so changes that can be easily implemented but have uh, less impact with respect to changes here that are uh, more difficult to be achieved but at the same time uh, would, would have a greater impact. Okay? As you can see here, there are no digital self-control tools, so they are not present here. Probably digital self-control tools are probably here, so uh, they have a very short-term impact. They are um, they can be easily implemented, at, uh, but again, they have a sh only a short-term impact. And then we have a list of possible strategies um, that have different uh, impacts, um, and we will analyze uh, all of them. So the first uh, leverage point uh, is design changes. Okay. So design changes are adjustments that uh, the same technology companies can make in the visual design and in the functionality offered by these platforms. Um, they can obviously have material impact uh, because they are embedded directly in the interface. Um, so there is, no this, there is no this contradiction having uh, external tools here. Uh, but obviously they are in a way similar to digital self-control tools as they do not address uh, root causes issues. Uh, some examples. Uh, this is taken from YouTube. Uh, it, it's something that resembles a digital self-control tool but is embedded directly in YouTube without the need of uh, an external application or Chrome extension. Uh, so. This is an example of some digital self-control tools like for taking a break directly embedded in the YouTube platform. And this is another probably more interesting example. Um, the mobile app uh, of Instagram, at least uh, until some versions ago, uh, allows you to hide the like count. Okay, so you, you can hide some quantitative statistics on your photos and on the photos of other people uh, to minimize this sort of uh, social comparison issue. Again, it's a strategy that is directly embedded uh, on, on Instagram. So Instagram decided to include this, this kind of feature. The second leverage point framework, internal governance. Um, so these are changes implemented by decision makers within a company um, and are changes that are uh, designed, implemented to shift 
how internal systems and structure operate. Some examples, boards within a company to supervise the safety of, of the design features uh, implemented by the company, or also uh, changing uh, employee bonuses to reward actions by designers that follow a given goal, for example, uh, to increase people's digital well-being. Um, there are also some uh, examples, although these examples are not always successful. Um, this is, for example, uh, an artificial intelligence board at, at Google that should uh, take into account all the issues of the usage uh, of AI in Google. Again, these examples are not always successful. As you may know, here is an article uh, reporting on the controversy and scandals related to, to this specific Google board. So they hired uh, Timmy Jebru to be um, an expert of an ethical AI, but then she was fired just for having uh, proposed a paper um, blaming Google for some unethical choices. Okay, so again, uh, these kind of examples are not always successful. Um, hello. The third leverage point, uh, external regulation. Okay, so while internal regulation is within a company, external regulation refers to outside forces like re re um, uh, legislators or regulators that set up boundaries for the same tech companies uh, through regulations, policies, uh, and so on. Uh, this obviously takes longer to, uh, to be established, uh, and this is the reason why this point if is after the internal regulation in the leverage point framework, but at the same time, they, may be, they, they can have a longer impact and also a higher impact, I think. Um, we don't have right now uh, specific examples on the digital wellbeing topic, but a related example uh, more about data protection and privacy is uh, GDPR, so the General Data Protection Regulation in Europe that set up some regulations, some boundaries for protecting uh, the privacy of the users. And recently uh, there are some examples in, uh, in the US mainly um, that are more in line with the digital wellbeing topic example, here is a, a regulation in California that bans uh, dark patterns that trick users into giving away their personal data. Again, it's more related to privacy, but we could easily envision uh, uh, expanding these regulations to include also, for example, attention capture dark patterns, uh, the patterns more related to digital well-being that we have seen in the previous lectures. Uh, and also, we we can also easily imagine some additions to the GDPR regulation to take into account not only the privacy of the users, but also uh, the attention of the, of the users. Then there is a business model, um, and this leverage point uh, refers to changes that shift the fundamental operations and profit structures of a firm. So it's probably more difficult to be achieved. Um, some practical examples, a company that moves to a sub subscription model instead of relying uh, only on advertising revenues. Um, and also we can envision solutions to redirect flows of capital from, from investors. Um, again, we don't have any specific examples of, on digital well-being yet, uh, but there is some examples about privacy. Uh, this is an article describing uh, how Apple is turning privacy into a business advantage, not just a marketing slogan, okay? Uh, and then we have the last uh, two points in this framework. One is redefining economic success. Right now, economic success for the companies in the digital world uh, is based mainly on advertising revenue. Uh, so we could, we could think about uh, changes here to change 
how to define this, this economic success to promote uh, users' digital well-being. And the last point is about culture and paradigm. Um, so changes that are uh, the highest leverage point in the figure um, and generally the most difficult to shift. Um, and a way to shift this, this paradigm is also, uh, I believe, th this course. And, and uh, so to allow users to be aware of the problems that technology may have. Um, so this kind of changes need a widespread change in core beliefs, values and operating norms um, and they need a mass shift in consumer sentiment, something that already happened for example with big tobacco and cigarettes. Um, two examples, yeah for example the documentary The Social Dilem Dilemma on Netflix and also several articles on the web and on mainstream media are trying to, uh, could be a way to, to achieve this, this specific uh, uh, culture and paradigm change. Okay. Any questions? Okay, so the idea is in some ways to exploit this framework uh, to move towards designing for digital well being. So designing technology, user interfaces that by nature respect user attention and, and digital well-being. Um, so instead of blocking possible interactions uh, through digital self-control tools, uh, some AXI researchers are trying to redesign the internal mechanisms used by uh, digital platforms uh, by using human-centered design processes, and by developing also guidelines, heuristics for designing and evaluating technologies that respect the digital well-being of the users. This is, for example, uh, a paper uh, describing an analysis of the YouTube platform uh, with end users. Um, and they conducted uh, some surveys and some interviews with <coughs> people, and they also asked people to uh, redesign the YouTube interface to respect their sense of agency and, and attention. Uh, and these are two examples. Um, and you can uh, read the paper if, if you want more details, but the idea here is to redesign the interface to respect the attention of, of the users. Um, again, besides redesigning existing platforms, an alternative is to propose, develop, uh, and evaluate guidelines and heuristics to design better technology. Uh, these are, for example, eight principles that are proposed by the Center for Humane Technology uh, to develop new policies and regulations. So they are not design guidelines, are guidelines for proposing new policies and regulations in the digital well-being domain. Again, uh, the website, the Center for Humane Technology, uh, has a wider perspective on the digital well-being topic, but I think they are uh, useful also for us. Uh, for example, put people first, um, address root causes, so go beyond symptoms to address the root causes of the problems or challenges brought by technology. Uh, and also this one is important for us, presume arms. So presume that all technologies and their applications are capable of inflicting a variety of arms uh, and seek to identify those arms. And this is something that we tried to achieve in the past lecture with the attention capture of their patterns. Um, so if you are interested in this topic and also in a wider uh, perspective on, digital will be on the digital will be in topics, so a perspective that also includes fake news, uh, privacy problems, and so on, you can enroll in this course that is free uh, on the Center for Humane Technology website. Um, and this course tries to um, understand and to uh, teach how we can design, develop new humane technology through a new humane technology paradigm. So this is the, in a way, 
a summary of the old extractive technology paradigm, the paradigm that is still used today by tech companies, and this is the new paradigm that you can find in the course. Um, so instead of maximize personalization, the course um, tries to push you to create shared understanding. Uh, instead of, um, okay, instead of technology is neutral, this paradigm that is uh, used in the contemporary design of technology, uh, the course uh, try to push you in supporting fairness and justice and, and so on. So if you are interested, it, it, it's a very interesting course um, and you can apply for free. Um, okay, and uh, so we, we have seen some uh, guidelines for um, regulations and policies, and in a recent work that is still in progress, um, we tried instead to develop some heuristics, some guidelines, uh, we'll see in a moment the difference between heuristics and guidelines, uh, to design for digital well-being. So these are um, advices, are heuristics again, uh, for designers, okay? Uh, and I think that you can also reuse these heuristics also in your um, research activities um, because they are rather generic. We conducted again a literature review um, through which we tried to extract this kind of heuristics. So first of all, uh, do you know what is an heuristic? Uh, I reported here three main um, uh, artifacts that we can use for uh, generating or analyzing design solutions. So starting from the uh, more generic one, we have theories, okay? So high level, widely applicable frameworks like the habit alteration framework that we have seen in, the, in a past lecture or all the psychological theories that we have addressed. Uh, to draw on during the design and evaluation, um, okay, as well as to support communication and teaching. So, theories. They are generic, they are abstract, mainly theoretical. Then, on the other side, we have guidelines that are specific low-level advice about good practices and cautions against dangers, okay? So, these are uh, very specific, practical, okay? Uh, that tells the designer uh, how to design or not to design a given feature, okay? And then we have something in the middle, heuristics, that are general principles uh, or rule of thumbs that can guide a design decision or that can be used to critique or evaluate a design that is already implemented. Okay, so it, it's something in the middle between guidelines, specific guidelines, and uh, abstract theories. So we tried to extract a set of heuristics for digital well-being, and we categorized them according to the self-determination theory. It is a behavioral theory that defines three basic psychological needs. Uh, autonomy, that is a sense of willingness, endorsement, so uh, a sense of acting according to my goal, to my intention. Then there is competence, that is the feeling uh, of being able and effective. There is a typo here. And relat uh, relatedness, uh, that is a social need, uh, so a feeling of being connected and involved with other people. Okay? Um, so this theory has been applied several times in XCI, in various domains, um, and we believe that uh, a minimum set of well-being requirements uh, should be applied to all technologies uh, respecting these three uh, basic psychological needs. Um, so we developed uh, eight heuristics um, by categorizing them under one of these uh, basic psychological needs. Uh, and the first four heuristics uh, are about supporting autonomy, okay? 
Uh, by the way, you will try to apply these heuristics to use these heuristics in the last assignment uh, next Thursday. So supporting autonomy means uh, supporting people to act willingly uh, according to their goals and values. Um, obviously, if you can't influence an interface in according with your goals, you get frustrated. Um, and so autonomy lies at the heart of many usability guidelines. So it's strictly related to the concept of usability of an interface. Um, and so again, autonomy is linked to goals and values. And if you respect autonomy, if a user interface respects autonomy, then a usage session with this interface is linked with a sense of meaning and, and part. So let's analyze the first four heuristics. Again, it's still a work in progress, so if you have any comments, feedback, feel free to interrupt me. The heuristic number one um, is defined. There is the title and a brief description. Uh, the title is Support Meaningful Attention and Sense of Agency. And the description is designed to support uh, experiences of focus, um, mindful awareness, and attention, breaking the link between the time spent and the interactions by the users on the platform and profit. Okay? Then each heuristic uh, has a set of uh, high-level strategies and some practical examples. So here are some strategies to respect this heuristic. Simplify the interface to support focus and avoid distractions that may disrupt attention. So something more related, for example, to interruptions from notifications uh, and so on. Um, okay, this is in some way related to the first strategy. Minimize distractions and help people reclaim and retain autonomy over their attention. Um, Provide users with tools for supporting self-regulation, like through usage dashboards, timers, and lockout mechanisms. OK, we understood that digital self-control tools uh, have some, some problems, but this doesn't mean that we should not use them. Um, another possible strategy, use positive friction mechanisms, like confirmation dialogues. Uh, to help users reflect on their actions, uh, uh, prevent errors, and avoid unintentional actions. Okay? Some practical examples. Okay, uh, this is an example that we have already seen before. Uh, the digital self-control tools included in uh, iPhones, Android devices, in YouTube. Okay? Uh, in Microsoft Word, there is this um, functionality, the focus mode, that uh, eliminates distraction by removing some menus uh, to let you focus uh, exactly on what you are typing. So uh, it's an example of a strategy that removes distractions. Another example, uh, in Netflix, after two or three episodes, I think, uh, there is this confirmation dialogue asking you if you uh, are still watching uh, uh, Netflix uh, and you can decide to continue or to uh, close the, the session, right? Um, so probably uh, designers uh, didn't include this uh, strategy with a digital well-being purpose, uh, probably, but it's an example of a of a strategy that could be useful also for from the digital well-being perspective. Okay. Second heuristic, uh, support informed usage sessions. This is the title. So provide the user with the information necessary for making choices for deciding whether it's worth starting or continuing a usage session, uh, making sure to adopt a transparent design that is clear about intentions and honest in action, okay? So, uh, to promote awareness about a given usage session. Some high-level strategies provide a preview of the status 
uh, of newly available content. We have seen last time that one of the main problems here is this variable reward technique. Um, so I don't know which posts I will, I will see on my Instagram feed, for example, and I don't know how many posts will be new. So I st still continue to browse my feed hoping for new content to appear. So if I can have a preview, okay, there are three new posts, uh, just three new posts, I, I could decide to not have in the session in the first place. Um, second strategy, allow users to preview what would happen if they made a particular choice, confident that they can undo or change their mind without cost, another strategy, so give a preview of a, of a choice. Uh, give an indication of how much time is needed to consume a content. Uh, this can avoid opening an app or a website if there is no new content or if I don't have enough time. So besides highlighting how many posts are new, uh, a strategy could be also uh, highlight uh, the time I need to read these this new posts. Prevent redirection, um, and here is a concrete example by enabling users to read and manage the content of a notification directly for, from the notification itself without the need to open the app and continue the session with maybe uh, other contents. Um, and also ensure that advertisements are relevant, transparent, and also clearly distinguishable <coughs> from other content. We have seen a specific pattern, specific dark pattern last time, the disguised ads and recommendations through which ads are disguised as, as for example, normal posts from other people. And this is clearly a problem. Uh, yeah, and the other one is to avoid the Roach model pattern. So ensure that users can easily find the option to log out, unsus unsubscribe, or delete their account if they choose to do so. Some examples, okay, in, um, I think this is, oh, I don't remember the name, uh, please help me, the, um, the blog post, uh, Medium, okay, it's Medium, um, is a blog, uh, is a platform for, uh, is a blogging flat platform, um, and uh, before the, the post, there is always uh, an estimation uh, of, um, how much time I need to read the entire post so that I can decide uh, if I have enough time to read the, the post or not. Uh, another example, uh, this is taken from Mastodon. Uh, it is a quite new social network uh, in which there is this section that is easily accessible and to which you can delete your account immediately in contrast with, for example, Facebook. Um, if you want to cancel your Facebook account, you have to perform many different steps. And then if there is a period of one month that during which if you access Facebook again, your account is automatically reactivated. Um, yeah, and this is a framework that explains um, how you can implement, how you can use um, advertisements uh, that are clearly distinguishable from other other content. Everything number three: promote content quality and instrumental use. Um, so, uh, adopt designs that allow users to maximize the overall quality of time uh, of time spent rather than the quantity by prioritizing instrumental use, so um, usage sessions that are performed with a clear goal uh, by the user, uh, rather than habitual ritualistic use, um, like mindlessly scrolling the uh, social network feeds. Some strategies um, allow users to make some plans to guide the their usage sessions. Um, so to, ena to enable them to make some kind of investment that persists beyond the isolated usage session. And we'll see a practical example. Um, we can also envision uh, letting the user switch between low and high control interfaces, uh, for example, by showing uh, different features um, 
according to the intention of, of the user for a given usage session. And here are some practical examples. Um, here on Twitter, recently they introduced this uh, two-tab design in which you can have the for you section uh, that also displays some recommended posts, uh, so posts from people that you don't follow or posts from uh, public uh, uh, people. And then you can also have the following tab that just show you uh, tweets and interactions from people and pages that you are following. And this could be probably an option to let the user decide which kind of session uh, is more appropriate. Um, this is a photo sharing platform in which um, recommendations are included in a given page, uh, the discover page, that is not in the, in the home page, so the user has to decide to, to watch the recommendations, and this is probably good. And another example is the watch later uh, playlist, uh, the full playlist by YouTube. And this is more related to uh, the first strategy, allow users to make plans. So I can decide to put a video in the watch later uh, playlist and consume it uh, next time. And the last heuristic about support autonomy is support personalization. So ensure that users can understand and personalize the digital environment uh, they are interacting with uh, to better suit their goals, values, and digital well-being. So uh, it's important to allow users to also change the features and designs adopted by uh, the user interfaces. Uh, for example, uh, a strategy could be offer options for users to personalize or disable a given design functionality uh, which may be perceived as destructive or attention capture or give users tools for giving feedback on, for example, the dark patterns adopted by a given interface. Some practical examples. Um, Autoplaying YouTube can be easily disabled. There is a slider under uh, each video. Uh, so it's an example uh, of a functionality through which users can disable some, some patterns in, in, in YouTube in this case. Uh, I don't know if you can read it. It's another example, uh, I think, from... Um, Mastodon, again, uh, there is uh, this uh, slow mode that basically um, eliminates the infinite scrolling and transforms the interface uh, and the results are shown uh, through pagination instead of uh, infinite scrolling. Okay. Uh, another example, this is, uh, I think, the... Um, Okay, the, the mobile app of Firefox, uh, you can disable pull to refresh, for example, the pull to refresh uh, pattern. So it's another example of personalization. And uh, there is also this example uh, from YouTube. Um, you can uh, use a scheduled digest for receiving notifications um, on a given uh, uh, in a given moment only, okay? So another example through which you can personalize uh, some features of, of, um, of a given interface. Questions? Okay, uh, support competence, uh, RISTIC 5 and, and 6. So competence is defined uh, as a feeling of being capable and effective um, and involves many different things um, like self-efficacy, learning and mastery. Um, so supporting competence, competence means providing optimal challenge, positive feedback and opportunities also for learning. 
Um, so the first heuristic is tailor usage to users and context. Ensure that the level of complexity or challenge required to start, perform, or end a usage session with a given digital service is appropriate for the user and, and context. So not all the users are the same. So we should really consider uh, users and context to provide different kinds of interfaces. So some strategies. Um, we could offer different levels of control for ritualized and instrumental use, uh, like providing users with higher control mechanisms when they have a specific intention in mind and lower control ones when they have a non-specific intention. So uh, if we are able to intercept the intention of the user, the kind of session that the user is going to have on the digital service, we could also modify the interface to maximize the uh, probability of respecting the digital well-being of our users. Another strategy, uh, okay, change the user interface based on a personalized prediction model. Again, if you are able to uh, capture some characteristics of the user, like uh, his level of self-control, uh, we could present, for example, a search-only interface and hide all the recommendations for a user that already demonstrated to have a low degree of self-control, for example. Um, another strategy, break down big tasks into uh, smaller parts, uh, and this is another strategy that we, can, that we can use. There are not so many examples in this case. Uh, the only one that I found, but if you have some examples, please tell me, um, is again on YouTube you have this version uh, YouTube Kids that is specifically designed for, for kids and through this platform a parent can set up the interface uh, according to uh, some characteristics of, um, of the kids uh, we can activate or uh, disable the search bar and we can set up some block list, some blacklist to avoid showing some category of videos and, and so on. So this is an example of a, a digital interface that is tailored uh, to a given uh, population. Okay. Heuristic number six, uh, offer uh, relevant digital will be in feedback, so provide feedback that informs uh, users about uh, their improvement towards digital well-being and a more sustainable technology use. Uh, for example, by informing them about their negative behaviors as well as their progresses and achievements. Uh, strategies? Um, okay, you can use different kind of, of feedbacks. Uh, here uh, we suggest to uh, look at this paper that proposes three different categories of feedback, granular, sustained, and cumulative. Um, promote instrumental use and reduce temptations to prolong usage sessions. Uh, so promote instrumental use uh, and not habitual use. Um, for example, by encouraging users to stop using the device when they have achieved their goal. And here are some examples. Um, okay, this is again a digital self-control tool, uh, Forest. We have already seen it uh, before. Um, this is an example on uh, how we can provide uh, Creative feedback, I would say. So uh, here, the progresses of the users are linked to this virtual tree. Uh, this is an example uh, from Gmail. Uh, I never experienced it, but when you delete all your uh, emails, uh, you receive this kind of messages. You are all done. Please enjoy your day. You have finished. Nothing in primary. Okay, so. In a way, this interface is encouraging you in, okay, close the smartphone and enjoy your day. But it's probably very difficult to be achieved. Um, 
And then this is an example, again, from a digital self-control tool, uh, screen time embedded on uh, smartphones, on uh, iPhones. But here, the, the interesting thing is in the feedback, uh, because the feedback is, OK, your screen time was down 41% last week for an average of one hour, 15 minutes a day. So uh, in this feedback, uh, the um, iPhone is also comparing uh, the usage time of this week with the previous week. So it allows you to show your progress uh, week by week in this case. So it's a sort of feedback that we, we, should, we should use. The last category, support relatedness. Um, so relatedness is described as a sense of belonging uh, to others. And it's obviously central across different well-being theories. Uh, and we all know that technology is increasing support social connection. So uh, these heuristics are surely uh, relevant uh, in the digital well-being topic. And the first heuristic is support meaningful connections. So support experiences of meaningful and fair connection to others, respecting the preferences of the user and the vulnerabilities uh, of, of, of the users and of others. Strategies. Um, focus feedback on intrinsic versus extrinsic related goal. For example, uh, pushing users to increase followers, number of likes, and quantitative metrics uh, um, is probably not well aligned with digital well-being. So it's something that we should avoid. Uh, and we could also ensure that users have the possibility to avoid social comparison with others. And here are some examples. Again, we already have seen this example in this lecture the possibility of hiding some quantitative statistics on, on Instagram. So I can decide to hide the like count. Uh, and I can do the same also on uh, Mastodon, I think, the other social network that I introduced before. So I can hide quantitative stats on profiles and also on posts. Okay, the last heuristic, support real-world connections, provide tools that facilitate real-world experiences and connections that go or may go beyond the screen. Some strategies. So disrupt social engagement as minimally as possible. Uh, so again, it's more related to distractions. Uh, ensure that users can keep their attention in the real world. Uh, and avoid obviously problems like uh, pubbing it is using the social uh, the, the smartphone in social context um, by facilitating for example the organization of in-person non-virtual meetups and activities and the uh, last high level strategy giving more importance to posts comments and interactions from close ties uh, some examples um, two examples basically uh, this is a modality that is present on some smartphones uh, if I turn my smartphone in this way uh, the smartphone is uh, automatically put in do not disturb mode so that I can uh, interact with other people without uh, distractions and another example uh, again uh, is this example from Twitter. Um, in a way, this kind of tab is prioritizing uh, interactions with close ties, with people that I'm following, right? Questions? Okay. If there are no questions, uh, since we have uh, enough time uh, I would like to introduce to you this new this final uh, evaluation technique that you are going to uh, use in the last assignment it will be 
I will try to be very brief so that then you can finalize your uh, the assignment too. Let me stop the registration and start it again. <coughs> 